Hey guys, my name is Dice Rowland. In the spirit of Christmas, I wanted to take a look at a movie that seems to be both cherished and overlooked by a lot of horror fans. It's seen as a classic and one of the best slasher-style movies of the 70s. It's also had two remakes now, and that's a review for a different time. Black Christmas was directed by Bob Clark and was released in America on December 20th, 1974. It has a pretty simple premise with some sorority sisters preparing for Christmas while some mysterious unknown stalker picks them off one by one. At face value, it sounds kind of cheap and cheesy, but there are some genuinely good and creepy moments. So without further ado, this is my review of Black Christmas. <laughs> The movie opens with a lovely rendition of Silent Night as a mysterious individual with a breathing problem stalks the sorority house. Lots of horror fans like to say that this was the movie to inspire so many of the killer POV shots in the following years, and I can see why. Inside, everyone's preparing for Christmas and having a Yuletide party. Here we meet Barb, played by the late Margot Kidder, Jess, played by Olivia Hussey, Phil, played by Andrea Martin, and Patrick, played by Michael Report. Because they're all caught up in the festivities, no one seems to notice the intruder who has made his way into the house. A rather obscene phone call gets everyone's attention, though. But Barb isn't having any of it. Oh, why don't you go find a wall socket and stick your tongue in it? That'll give you a charge. Claire, played by Lynn Griffin, points out that it's probably not a great idea to be taunting the caller, and goes upstairs to do some packing. At the same time, we're introduced to the house mother, Mrs. Mack, played by Marion Waldeman. Unfortunately for Claire, the unknown stranger has made his way into her closet, and strangles her with a plastic bag before for hiding her in the attic. Everyone downstairs is a little too busy to notice that anything is wrong, though. Jess gets a phone call from Peter, played by Kier Dilu, and tells him that she really needs to speak with him about something important. The next day, Claire's father, played by James Edmund, begins to suspect that something is wrong when his daughter fails to meet him on time. So he goes to the sorority house to get some answers. I have to say that the interactions between Mr. Harrison and Mrs. Mack throughout these scenes are rather amusing. Meanwhile, Jess meets with Peter to tell him that she's pregnant. However, she's planning an abortion, much to the disapproval of Peter. Needless to say, it doesn't exactly go over very well. One more disturbing phone call later, and Mr. Harrison, Phil, and Barb go to the police station to report Claire as missing. Other than a fellatio joke, not much is achieved by the group here. Jess goes to Claire's boyfriend, Chris, played by Art Hindle, to see if he had seen her. Did I mention this was a Canadian horror movie? She tells him that they tried reporting Claire as missing, but they weren't taken seriously. Chris isn't exactly pleased to hear that. Nash, you stupid son of a bitch, you got a big goddamn mouth! Thankfully, Nancy Thompson's father is there to handle things. I mean, Lieutenant Ken Fuller, who is obviously played by John Saxon. But seriously, are there any theories out there as to whether or not Lieutenant Fuller and Lieutenant Thompson are related? Later that night, Mr. Harrison, Mrs. Mack, Phil and Barb return to the sorority house to wait for some news on Claire. And, uh, Barb isn't exactly helping the situation. There's a certain species of turtle that can screw for three days without stopping. Tell him about dolphin penis. He'll love that. On a side note, if you pay attention to Mrs. Mac during this, you can literally see her soul leave her body. <laughs> Elsewhere, Peter's recital didn't go exactly as he had planned, apparently. And like a true artist, he takes it out on his instrument. But there's no time for that level of bitch fit, as Jess and Chris have news. A group of people have gathered to search for Claire and Janice, another girl who went missing. Bad news is, they don't find Claire. Also bad news, they do find Janice. <laughs> At the sorority house, Mrs. Mack is preparing to leave to visit her sister, but her elusive cat, Claude, distracts her once again. Now listen, I love cats, and I am 100% for getting the cat and getting the hell out, but in this case, this is a major horror movie no-no. <laughs> Jess arrives back at the sorority house just in time for yet another creepy phone call from Billy, and for Peter to rival that level of creepiness. 
Nope, that's it. I don't care if Peter is the killer or not. He's the certified asshole of this movie. Speaking of assholes, Sergeant Nash over here isn't exactly being very helpful. Jess and Peter discuss their future and relationship, and by that I mean Peter is all for quitting his current pianist dream, getting married, and having a baby. But Jess isn't on the same page with that. Peter, I don't want to marry you. At the police station, the fellatio joke pays off, and honestly, it's mainly because of this guy's reaction. Lieutenant Fuller and Graham go to the sorority house to investigate those obscene phone calls, and to put a tap on one of the phones so that they can trace the call. The trick is, they have to keep Billy on the line as long as possible. Just ask him what his favorite scary movie is. Once the police get everything set and go back to the station, Phil decides to get some sleep, while Jess stays by the phone. There's a bit of a scare when Barb wakes up to an asthma attack due to what she believes is a nightmare about a stranger in her room. That's actually a lot closer to reality than she or Jess is aware of. Jess gets distracted by some carolers, which gives the killer enough time to be able to stab Barb to death with a glass unicorn. The carolers are ushered away since news of Janice's murder is getting around, and Jess answers another call from Billy. Unfortunately, the psycho didn't stay on the line long enough for Graham to pinpoint his location, though suspicion about whether or not Billy is really Peter arises because of something he had said, matching with what Peter had said to Jess earlier. The phone rings yet again, but this time, it's Peter. And he's gone off the deep end. This doesn't provide any answers, but Lieutenant Fuller does have some questions since he was listening in. Peter's an artist. He's very high strung. Upon further analysis, Jess realizes that this Billy couldn't be Peter, as he was with her during one of the calls earlier that evening. So, the search for the killer continues. And it's only just now that Phil and Jess decide it would be a good idea to check and be sure that all doors and windows are locked. It's a little fucking late! With that, it's time once again for Billy to give Jess a call. Thankfully, he raves on the line just long enough for Graham to successfully trace the call. And here's the twist. The caller is in the house. The calls are coming from the house. That's right! You can thank this movie for starting the whole horror movie trope of the calls are coming from inside the house. Some more bad news is that officer stationed outside of the sorority house is dead too. Nash is tasked with trying to get Jess to leave the house and save herself, but Jess is concerned about Phil and Barb. To her credit, at least she takes a solid iron fire poker with her. However, it's never a good idea to go upstairs. But that's exactly what she does, and she finds her remaining friends. Or should I say, what remains of her friends. And this is where we get one of the most recognized and memorable moments in the film. Agnes, it's me, Billy. Jess struggles briefly with Billy before locking herself in the basement. There also appears to be someone skulking around outside. Turns out it's Peter, which honestly doesn't ease any worries here. The police arrive to find Jess passed out and Peter, uh, well, bludgeoned to death. You got knocked the fuck out! The police come to the conclusion that Peter was Billy and Jess is taken up to her room, since she's still out of it. So everyone leaves to wrap this whole thing up. The final twist, however, is that Billy is still in the house too. So you're just gonna leave her in there, huh? You're not gonna check the attic or anything? Is, um... <clears throat> uh, is anybody gonna answer that? No. I then. Worst police force ever. And with that, the credits roll, leaving the audience feeling very uneasy. Jess is left in an even more vulnerable state than before. The killer is very much alive and still lurking around. And the phone is ringing once again. A very cliffhanger ending. The whole look of the film is very 70s with all the decorations of the sorority house. But it also managed to capture a certain essence of Christmas too. Not just because of the lights and decorations and stuff. Given that a lot of the movie takes place at night, 
It fits the title in an odd way. The darkness of the night combined with the festive lights of Christmas. It's pretty interesting for the subject matter. I like to mention soundtracks when I discuss movies, but there's not much at all to talk about here. I'm pretty sure that's intentional because even in the end credits, there's no music. Just a telephone ringing and the cold wind. You do have some Christmas songs once in a while and some shock or tension building noises. Other than that, the soundtrack is very bare. There's no special effects to speak of here and minimal practical effects. With that being said, the practical effects for stuff like blood and wounds left something to be desired. It's not convincing at all, but it was the 70s. Just kinda looks like they got a little too excited with the paint. The acting is decent on everyone's part. I wasn't yanked out of the experience by any of the actors. Is it top-notch acting worthy of an award? No. But everyone filled out their respective characters and made it believable. However, Bob Clark, Ann Sweeney, and Nick Mancuso did a memorable job with Billy's voice over the phone. As I mentioned before, it would have been very easy for the premise of Black Christmas to be turned into a gory, grisly slaughter fest with no real substance. But it wasn't. The plot takes itself pretty seriously with a number of heavy subjects that girls in college actually face. At the same time, it throws in some humor that isn't drastically jarring from the story. It did feel like it was dragging a bit here and there, but it does have mystery elements that take time to piece together, so I can forgive it for that. This wasn't all about the killer either, there were subplots that unfolded too, and they didn't get all tangled together and made the whole thing confusing. I do have to applaud the fact that everything wasn't wrapped up in a neat little bow for the viewer. You don't get a whole big explanation of who Billy is and why he's going around killing girls. You get hints, but nothing is drawn out for you in detail. And for me, that makes it all the more unsettling and dare I say, real. With all the comparisons that have been made between Black Christmas and Halloween, I like to think that if Halloween is the godfather of slasher horror, then Black Christmas is the granddad. Given that this was my first time watching Black Christmas, I have to say, whatever my expectations were, it went past them. Maybe not in a spectacular fashion, but it still turned out to be more than I originally thought it would be. So, with that being said, I'm giving Black Christmas 7 out of 10 bloody thumbs up. It's an excellent choice for a classic horror movie for the holiday season, and I'll likely be making it an annual tradition to watch it. I recommend Black Christmas to horror fans who need a breath of fresh air from all of those kids' Christmas specials and Hallmark romance movies. Fans of Final Girls and slasher movies. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like to let me know. And don't forget to leave a comment down below telling me what you think of this movie and if you have any suggestions for horror movies you would like to see me review in the future. I'll also don't forget to share this video to help the channel grow and subscribe for more videos like this. See you next year.